Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Library's Adulting 101 series. Um, this one's called Hit the Road All About Travel. Um, we're going to be talking about study abroad. We're going to be talking about independent travel over the next hour. And we've got some uh, really great panelists um, who will lend their expertise. So without further ado, I am Ben Alkali, uh, the library's uh, UCLA Libraries Communications and Marketing Manager. I'll be emceeing, moderating uh, today, and then providing some of my own personal travel tips. So just kind of to go over what we'll cover today. So UCLA study abroad opportunities, then uh, a Q&A with some past study abroad participants, and as I mentioned, some travel tips and tricks. Um, but first, let's do a quick icebreaker. Um, don't have a ton of time. So just in the chat, if you would, just drop, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Love to see the responses come in for one year. Don't have to commit there for life. Oh, good answers. Giselle says Denmark, Courtney says Portugal, Sophia says Sweden, Jacqueline says Turkey, oh, Holland, oh, lots going on here. <laughs> Appreciate it, okay. Good answers, thanks for sharing everybody. Um, and without further ado, we're gonna go into some study abroad opportunities through UCLA. Um, we're fortunate enough to be joined by Magdalena Baragon. She's the executive director uh, for UCLA's International Education Office. And in that role, Magdalena oversees all undergraduate study abroad programs at UCLA. Um, prior to her position, she worked at uh, UCLA Anderson School of Management, uh, where she managed student exchanges and was the primary advisor for international students. She's passionate about creating opportunities abroad for all students, and her mission is to send out as many UCLA students as possible to experience and learn about our commonalities and differences with the rest of the world. Magdalena studied French literature and languages as an undergrad at UCLA. And without further ado, um, take it away, Magdalena. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, yes, as mentioned, um, I am privileged to serve in the role as executive director overseeing our undergraduate uh, study abroad programs. And I am really grateful for this opportunity to reach out to all of you and encourage you to think about all of your opportunities while you're here at UCLA. Uh, in this session, we'll go over some of the basics uh, about studying abroad at UCLA, including our top five reasons and why um, you should study abroad. Um, you should not miss this. Uh, this is, I would say, one of the top regrets that we hear from alums is that they didn't study abroad. And also for those who did participate, we have a lot of data from seniors over the past few years who say it was the best thing they ever did during their time at UCLA. So I want to encourage all of you to, to make the effort and to think about um, where you could see yourself um, moving forward in the future. To help facilitate the conversation, I'm going to mute my image or just uh, cancel my image and we'll go through the slides together and then I'll come back on screen and help answer any questions. Um, so let me do that just to get started. Um, so uh, let's go to the next slide then. Sorry, technical difficulties, let's advance. There we are, you see the slide you need? Uh, no, let's see. I'm not seeing it. Are you, maybe I've got the wrong view on here. I'm still okay. seeing the original one. I'm sorry, let's go back. Here? Uh, one more. No go? Yeah, I don't see it. What what screen is everyone seeing? I'm trying to get to the second slide, which will be, um, let's see, the start here, go anywhere. Are you seeing that? Yeah, that's what I Okay, mean. okay, so there we are. You're right, sorry about that. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so just to get started, I just wanna, you know, talk a little bit about our office um, in terms of who we are and what we do. Uh, the UCLA International Education Office, uh, aka the Study Abroad Office, is, is the one-stop shop for all our undergraduate students considering studying abroad. Uh, we also have a few U.S.-based programs, like in New York City, 
Um, so there are a variety of options for students to consider. We think that the exposure to another part of the world is important um, and really essential for students to you know, position themselves in the best way possible for their future careers. Um, we have a seasoned team of advisors and coordinators to guide students through their program planning and exploration. We have pre-departure readiness and support while abroad and upon re-entry. Um, so we're really trying to, you know, create a, a full life cycle of uh, a student's experience once they decide to study abroad from nurturing you and guiding you in the decision on where you're going to go throughout the, the time you're abroad. And then uh, on your return, we're working diligently to create more resources that you can apply for your uh, job interviews and uh, partnerships with the Career Center so that you gain as much as possible from that experience abroad. We do also hold a number of events throughout the year. Some are major specific sessions. We hold financial aid and scholarship workshops as well as our annual study abroad fair in the fall um, where students can learn a little bit more about the variety of options that are available. Um, we also have students uh, you know, a group of students who are developing an alumni of study abroad participants to connect you with peers who've already gone abroad on this journey to hear what it's like from them directly on what their experience was like and to gain some insights or tips from them as well. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so these are the top five reasons to study abroad. Um, and it's also helping you understand uh, there are a lot of preconceived notions that students have when they think about studying abroad. We hear a lot from students who say, well, studying abroad is for people who study languages or a particular field. I wanna make sure you know that any major can study abroad. It doesn't matter what your major is. Uh, there's not just one, but a handful of study abroad programs uh, for you and UCLA students are not obligated to pick a particular one um, or even one that's tied to your particular major. For example, if you're a biology student and you wanna study biology abroad, um, it could be at a Japanese university conducting field work in the rainforests of Costa Rica, or among other options, we have something for you to make progress towards your UCLA degree. You also have general elective requirements that you can satisfy abroad. You don't have to uh, take a major specific course. You have a lot of opportunities within your time at UCLA to decide where you wanna go and what you wanna study while you're abroad. So we really encourage students to think early, as early as possible about what can they do in another part of the world? And that can be, again, a general election, a general elective, a diversity requirement, or a major specific um, requirement as well. We also have um, some really not interesting non-traditional opportunities. Um, you know, the meaning of study abroad at UCLA has expanded beyond just traditional language and culture programs uh, that study abroad used to be known for. Our programs are uh, no longer just for humanities and social science majors. At UCLA, STEM students can equally participate in study abroad. In fact, we are extremely proud that our university is now one of the only UC campuses that officially sends more undergraduate STEM students on study abroad than non-STEM. Um, and that's really unique, um, again, within the UCs and even on a, a national level. Uh, comparatively, STEM students on study abroad are actually underrepresented uh, across the US. Uh, so we see this as a huge achievement here at UCLA to provide opportunities for our STEM majors. Uh, while we do still have programs that focus on language and culture, we also have opportunities for students that conduct research in labs in Singapore, field work off the coast of Australia, and secure an, an internship in global health in Colombia. You can study at the United Nations in New York over a summer, or take courses at UNAM in Mexico City in Spanish, among other local students. Again, possibilities are really uh, plentiful and almost endless. We have programs in English, um, and this is uh, another myth that we often hear. Uh, students are concerned that maybe they don't know uh, a different language and that they will have difficulties while they're abroad. The vast majority of our programs are in English, um, even though they are placed in another part of the world. Um, 
So first of all, there are about half a dozen destinations available to you um, where UCLA is already the primary language. And those are countries like New Zealand, Australia, UK, South Africa, or Ireland. So um, the country there already has English as a primary. Um, and those are always easier options for students who are concerned about immersing themselves in a country where a different language is spoken. Uh, but we do encourage students to push themselves. And especially if you have any language um, training or education in your, in your, under your belt, you can certainly polish that while you're in another part of the world. Um, you will also be able to get around and learn a lot of the local language in countries where another language is spoken. Um, it is just a natural uh, skill that you will pick up while you're there. Um, and again, there are lots of programs with lots of different majors and opportunities for you to uh, explore. The affordability of study abroad. Often there is also a lot of concern about what does it cost? It's too expensive. I know I thought that when I was an undergraduate. Um, and, you know, admittedly, some of the study abroad programs can be more expensive than staying at UCLA. Um, but I do want to make sure that everyone understands that um, there is quite a bit of, there are very many variables that can help you manage the expense. Um, things like the duration of the program, when you go abroad, and also to assure you all that uh, our study abroad programs, because they are for credit, they are helping you make time towards your degree, um, are funded by financial aid. So you can get loans uh, for these programs. There are also scholarship opportunities for study abroad programs. Every year we have um, a large uh, communication to the campus about study abroad scholarships. Um, there are you know, a variety of ranges. Some of them pay for half of your program fees. Some of them might pay for all of your program fees. So you know, you're encouraged to not, not give up just because you're looking at a cost for a program. Come to our office and talk to us because we can help you find a way to get there. Um, I mentioned making time to degree. The, the sort of fifth reason is because you will graduate on time. We've done a lot of stu studies and uh, run a lot of data over the last few years uh, to confirm this. Uh, most of the students, uh, vast majority of the students who participate in study abroad graduate on time, if not a little early. Again, and that's because you are earning credits that you will use uh, for your degree, your satisfying major, minor, um, or general education requirements. And so it is not going to set you behind for participating in study abroad. In fact, we sometimes see students more and more choosing to do more than one study abroad um, opportunity, a summer and a fall abroad, or maybe two summers. So you are earning those credits and continuing your progress towards graduation. Next slide, please. Um, these are really just kind of the essential steps for you to think through um, as you are preparing or considering studying abroad. The first is really kind of exploring where do you want to go? Um, it's a big world, lots of different options and narrowing, you know, what kinds of things are you looking for to expose yourself? I think on a sort of larger scale is a good idea. Uh, planning wisely, you know, being realistic about your plans. Do you want to be abroad for a year, for a term, for a summer? And then consulting with us, coming to our office, checking on our website. You'll find a lot of information on our website. We look at it quite regularly and uh, we try to keep thing, information very current. But you are always welcome to come to our office, um, you know, meet with us virtually. Um, lots of different ways to connect with us. We have a lot of info sessions, as I mentioned. And a really key point is to apply early. Students are often surprised how early you need to apply for a program. And that's because there's a lot of planning and coordination on the ground, logistics that have to be prepared for students' arrival in any part of the world. So um, it's I would give yourself about nine months ahead of time from the term that you are considering going abroad. So that gives you enough time to, again, look at all your options, make your applications, apply for financial aid, scholarships, um, and that really will give, guarantee you the most um, opportunities. Most of our programs are first come, first serve. So the competition um, are your peers, and we do see a lot of interest in study abroad, especially as we're resuming 
sort of life, uh, you know, after our, our shutdown and our lockdown, um, I think a lot of students are interested and curious and wanting the opportunity to explore and get back out there. And we, of course, are encouraging of you as well. We do keep safety in mind um, with or without COVID in the picture. We are always concerned about making this experience as safe as possible. And uh, we spend a lot of time uh, on the ground here and throughout the time you are abroad, ensuring that you have resources and um, that all of the risks have been mitigated to the best of our ability. Next slide. Um, I mentioned there are so many program options um, in the UC offering. Um, UCLA students can experience a spectrum of study abroad programs. We've got 200 plus programs in 45 countries. Um, we have a variety of types of programs. We have the EAP program, which we'll go into. That's our largest program offering. That's a UC system-wide offering. So you can take classes with other UC students on those programs. We have our own campus-based programs like the travel study program, our global internship program, our exchange program, and our global cities program. I'll go to the next slide. Um, so we talked about different kinds of program types. Uh, we have what's called a traditional university immersion. That's where you study at a local university with local students. And in this particular example, we would, uh, we would say the UCEAP program is the program that has the majority of these types of program. And that is a system-wide program where you can take a class with a Berkeley student, a Riverside student, uh, San Diego, all UC programs apply to the same experiences overseas. Um, so if you've got friends in other campuses, uh, it's a cool experience that you can maybe meet up with them in a different part of the world. Uh, you are immersed, you are taught at a local institution um, by the local faculty there. So it's really um, more of a traditional model, we'll say. And then we have our campus-based programs, which are programs that we develop here at UCLA specifically for UCLA students. We have our UCLA faculty-led program, which is really what I call a classroom abroad. It's a program or a course that is a UCLA-approved course for UCLA credit led by a UCLA faculty member. Um, and it's just situated in a different part of the world. And the range is, you know, everything from language to, um, we do have an engineering class, we've got food studies, we've got lots of different courses that satisfy, again, major, minor, um, or degree, just general, lecture, general elective requirements. Um, so please do check those out. Our newest program is the Global Internship Program. And this is an opportunity for students to do internships or research abroad for credit. Uh, we have uh, the Global Internship Program is one that we've designed, and the EAP program also has research uh, opportunities abroad, and again, dozens others. So, you know, you're encouraged to maybe think through the type of experience you want as sort of a, an initial step for determining where you're going to study abroad. Next slide. Um, it's all about planning. Uh, it can't be said uh, enough. Um, it is, uh, I would say 96% of students who study abroad receive major credit. Um, and that's really a great opportunity for you so that you can, um, again, explain this to your parents, uh, know confidently that you are not wasting your time and understand the value of these opportunities uh, is more than just the experience in a different part of the world. It's actually working for you. It's helping you graduate on time, um, again, if not early. Um, studying abroad takes careful academic and financial planning. It's possible to find a program that helps in your progress towards your major or degree requirements. In most cases, there is no formulaic way to study abroad. Students think about their personal, academic, and professional goals. UCLA degree requirements, major GEs, foreign language, technical breadth, and there is no one right time to study abroad. Some first year students study uh, as soon as their first coming summer and others go in the spring of their senior year. We are seeing more students choosing to study abroad earlier 
Um, and that makes me very happy because I think, again, there's an opportunity to really influence your field of study and help you in your development um, as a Bruin and help you in your career uh, you know, goals as well. Sometimes we see students who go abroad and decide maybe they want to change their major or maybe this experience helps them think about a different career path. So again, you don't have to wait until junior year, but planning is essential. So plan as early as you can. Next slide. Um, regardless of when you study abroad, um, again, the planning, the earlier is the better. Um, even as your first year, as I said, you can, you can certainly start to do that. Um, I encourage you to connect with us. It doesn't have to be any particular time of the year. We have virtual advising sessions um, and you can come and talk about your major, maybe what you're thinking, maybe the program type, and we'll, we'll help guide that conversation for you. Um, this is just really kind of giving you a visual timeline of what that can look like for you um, in terms of preparation for getting to that study abroad, boarding the plane and, and getting to your, the new destination where you're going to have an amazing experience. Um, again, petitioning for study abroad courses if you need to, and then finalizing the exact courses that you're getting, getting all of your financial aid in time, uh, your housing, all of those things take time. And so just, again, uh, give yourself all of the opportunities to succeed and uh, plan the best opportunity for yourself. Next slide. So funding um, for financial aid is available for all eligible students for all of our programs. Again, because these are credit bearing programs, you can uh, use financial aid here at UCLA to fund them if you're eligible. Um, but there are a number of ways if, that you can, in general, finance any of the opportunities. Other than financial aid, there are scholarships, as I mentioned, there may be personal funds. Students sometimes tell us that they will ask their family for uh, money or opportunities like airfare tickets instead of Christmas presents if they know they're working towards that goal of studying abroad. And so again, that's, this is where that planning really pays off um, in very literal ways. So again, there are many ways for you to get there. I, if I can impress anything for all of you on this call is you can do it. You can get there and we can help you. There are many, many opportunities that um, we're eager to share with students. And um, it isn't always obvious to you and, and until you come in and talk to us and, and we can help you try to map that out a little more clearly. Next slide. Um, just to give you an, a cost comparison of what it might look like, um, don't panic when you look at these numbers. Um, I'll sort of walk you through what you're seeing here. Um, when we look at what program, again, no program costs the same, and that's because it's determined by location, by the duration of the program, um, and the type of experience that you're having. And so what I hope to convey here is just um, give you a couple of programs to look at and see how expensive or affordable these programs can be. Um, the programs can be either more expensive than the ones you're seeing here or less expensive. There's again, a very broad range and again, determined by all of those variables that I just mentioned. Um, there is no uh, resident tuition for summer. Um, and again, a quarter at UCLA ballpark, give or take is about almost $10,000 um, and a semester abroad, which is two quarters is about uh, $20,000 abroad. Again, but that's two quarters. Um, that includes housing, that includes a number of other excursions. And so you need to kind of really think through and weigh out what these numbers mean for each of these experiences. When we look at the cost comparison on the screen, you have a Granada summer program. That's five weeks. That includes your housing, that includes excursions to museums, um, some transportation on the ground, getting to and from venues. Um, and so your program fee, the cost that you will pay for that program is $6,000. Then we have a suggested budget for you in terms of how much money to bring along. And then you factor in your airfare as well. So, you know, ballpark, it would be about 10,000 for that experience, but it's not just tuition, it's housing, 
some meals, excursions, um, all of that is, is factored into that final number. Um, and then you look at the Contemporary Mexico summer program, also five weeks, but look at the units, you get 11 units. Um, and the program fee is about just under $5,000, which is pretty reasonable. Again, includes housing, excursions, your credit, um, and your costs, your expected costs there. Mexico is um, less expensive than Spain. So it's, you see that reflected in the number. And your airfare, obviously also, it's a closer destination. It's much cheaper. And so the cost for that summer experience, you see a, a significant difference there. And the last one we're looking at is the summer physics program in Ireland. Again, that's a longer session. That's eight weeks in Europe for 12 units. So those are gonna be variables that you see bring up the cost. Um, when you consider 12 units, that's a whole quarter, um, but you're doing that in one summer. And again, that includes your housing, excursions, um, some meals, I believe as well. And so it's important to see what, you, you know, understand what you're comparing. Um, what would a session at UCLA for summer cost you or any other term of the year at UCLA when you factor in housing, excursions and all of those things. And I think you'll start to see the picture really kind of normalize. And in some cases, you might find it even less expensive um, than attending UCLA. And next slide, please. And sorry, Margalita, I just want to interject and say, um, we're actually running a little behind schedule. I okay, don't, okay. Want, to, I don't right. want to rush you, but um, no. it's all incredible information, but I just want to plant that seed. I'm sorry. Thank you. No worries. I'll go, I'll move a little quicker. Thank you. Um, let's go to the next slide. Let's see. Okay. Um, we again, just recommend coming to our office or, or sorry, the virtual advising is available to everyone. We have study abroad advisors. You can also talk to your major and school advisors. Um, we have peers from prior participants that you can check in with and certainly family and loved ones, see if they have any advice. Maybe they did study abroad as well. Um, next slide. Uh, again, key is applying early. Uh, as early as possible, but no later than four months ahead of time. It is competitive in that it's first come first serve. So it's, it's difficult for us to tell you what it would be for a specific program, uh, but you wanna position yourself in the best way possible. Um, just to give you a point of reference, applications for summer 2023 open in the fall of 2022. Um, and again, that's a first come first serve. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, safety is important to us, as I mentioned earlier. So we've got a lot of resources on the ground. We spend a lot of time planning. We will have staff on call. Um, we double insure students uh, for most of our programs. And we are dialed into a lot of resources on a national and state level to make sure that students are cared for um, in the event of any crisis, including COVID. And next slide. Um, we also feel very strongly in our program that um, all, all students should have the opportunity to study abroad and that it very much touches on diversity and how we can continue to diversify the pool of students who have these opportunities. We've developed a number of resources on our website and you'll see the bit.ly link there. Um, I encourage students uh, with you know, uh, intersection, intersecting identities to check them out. We've spent a lot of time on that and we want to assure everyone that study abroad is for you. Next slide. Um, this is our contact information. And um, again, we are available for virtual advising. Um, please check out our website, shoot us an email. Um, we are eager to talk with you and to help you plan your next adventure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magdalena. Um, I pangs of regret here. Um, as I told you and Giselle earlier, I didn't take advantage of the opportunity to study abroad. Um, so I hope this information is really valuable for our students in the room who may be on the fence um, and now maybe considering studying abroad. Are there any questions for Magdalena before we move on to our um, Q&A panel? And feel free to use the hand raising and I will happily unmute you. 
Oh, I don't think I see any Henry's. I'm just scanning through here. I think we're good. So let's um let's move on and hear from um a pair of Bruins who are previous study abroad um participants. With us, we have a we have Giselle Rios. Um, she is a UCLA library employee. She works in the Charles E. Young Research Library, where she assists with collection development of Western European materials, as well as overseas efforts for her department, outreach efforts for her department. She's simultaneously um, earning her master's degree in library and information sciences, and she expects to graduate at the end of this quarter. Congrats, <laughs> Giselle. Um, prior to this role, Giselle worked at UCLA summer sessions where she scheduled programs and classes for academic departments. Um, Giselle studied Latin American and US history as an undergraduate at Georgetown University. And while she was a Hoya, she studied abroad in Denmark. And then we're also uh, fortunate enough to be joined uh, by Jacqueline Tafoya, uh, a 2021 graduate of UCLA um, with a degree in Chicanx and Latin Central American studies. Um, in her junior year, uh, uh, Jacqueline studied abroad in Mexico City through UC Study Abroad, and she recently began working as an intake advisor um, it, alongside Magdalena in UCLA's International Education Office after previously serving um, UCLA Destination College Advising Corps. So without further ado, let's hop into our Q&A. And if anyone here has any questions um, for Jacqueline or Giselle, please just raise your hand. But we have a few um, preset questions we're going to ask both of them. One, so what compelled each of you to study abroad? Um, you go first. <laughs> I can go first. So um, I was very fortunate enough to have a professor who uh, really encouraged me to study abroad at first, um, being first generation college student, I had no idea I had this opportunity. Um, I'm also not from LA. Um, I grew up in a very small town. So those options were never open for me. I never knew anybody from my uh, community who had done it. So when I went to office hours, I had a professor who really encouraged me after I was um, sharing about my passions and my interests. My family is from Mexico, so I did highlight that, and that's where she suggested I study abroad. Um, then I um, came for an appointment here at the study abroad office, and um, the advisor here was very kind, very nice, and detailed everything for the program, um, and that further um, encouraged me to go ahead and apply and um, that's what compelled me. So I had both my professor and then the advisor who um, compelled me to study abroad. Actually, before we go into Giselle, we had a question in the chat from Courtney. It said, do you need to be fluent in Spanish to live in Mexico City? I, I assume she mean also study abroad in Mexico City. Um, though I am fluent, my specific program was at a university at uh, in Mexico City. So my classes were taught in Spanish. However, um, there's different uh, programs where you do not have to be fluent, where the classes will be in English. So um, definitely encourage you to come to the office or have um, an appointment set up with one of our counselors and they can further detail the programs that we have. But the short answer is no. Awesome. Uh, Giselle, what compelled you to study abroad? So I studied abroad because um, when I transferred to Georgetown, I, um, as a first generation student, I was on scholarship. And that's when I realized that I had um, about two years to enjoy Georgetown. And as much as I really wanted to spend as much time as possible on my new, um, at my new school, um, I took advantage of that scholarship and decided um, I was going to study abroad for an entire year. And so that's what I did. I studied abroad for two semesters um, in Denmark. And I think it was um, definitely the best decision I could have made is um, although I kind of disrupted my timeline, I could have graduated um, a little sooner, but by studying abroad, I think I gained so much more. That's great. Um, our second question. So there, as Magdalena kind of went over, there are different types of study abroad experiences. Um, tell us about your particular study abroad experience and why did you pick your program? Um, I originally wanted to go to Spain, however, um, it all came down to me 
specifically with finance um, and Mexico, the fest was just cheaper and I just really wanted to make the most out of it. So that's why I ended up choosing Mexico City. Um, as I mentioned, I am Mexican American. So I always wanted to explore my culture more. And I always had a dream of being there for Independence Day and celebrating my family's country of origin, which I was able to do thanks to studying abroad. Um, personally, um, I had several reasons for one, for picking my particular program, which was the Danish Institute for Study Abroad in Copenhagen. But um, one of the main reasons was that back when um, I was looking for um, programs to study abroad in, um, they didn't have a lot of options in Scandinavia, and I had a general idea that I wanted to, uh, you know, explore and live in Scandinavia. And the only program that they had was in Copenhagen. And upon, upon closer inspection, what stood out to be about my program was that it was really unique and that you could um, concentrate in a specific um, subject area each semester. And based on that specialization, you would study abroad with, um, they would actually take you on a trip with your entire class. Um, and that was included in the program. And it just seemed like a really um, well set up program. So it wasn't just the fact that I wanted to be in Scandinavia was also the program itself and the fact that it offered so many different um, housing options and opportunities that stood out to me and made it um, more appealing than other programs that I was looking at. Thanks. Third question, what was one academic and one non-academic highlight of your time abroad? Um, an academic was, um, I always share this with people that I ended up learning Mandarin in Mexico City. Um, the school there just had a lot of different opportunities, um, one being being able to learn another language. Um, again, the best was very cheap, so my books ended up being like a dollar or so. So I just took the opportunity and I began to learn Mandarin. And that eventually opened the door for me to explore more languages. And so now I'm learning Korean little by little. Um, and so that was a really awesome um, academic highlight abroad. Um, I also was able to um, develop my Spanish, particularly my academic Spanish, my academia Spanish, um, but definitely Mandarin because I was also able to meet other people. Um, the school that I was in specifically is very well known within Latin America. It's called UNAM. And so there was a lot of different international students who arrived there as well to study abroad. And so I met um, students from China. And so while I was also practicing my Spanish, I was also trying to practice my Mandarin, which I thought was very awesome. Um, and then a non-academic highlight are definitely the friendships. As I mentioned, not only was I able to communicate um, with my native language in Spanish with other students from China, for example, um, but I was also able to have friendships from um, develop with students who went to like UC Davis, UC Santa Cruz. And so I was also able to kind of network in a way, um, which I definitely uh, enjoyed. So for me, an academic highlight was um, learning Danish. It was, uh, um, so as students in the Danish Institute for Study Abroad, we were required to take Danish every um, semester that we were there. So I ended up taking Danish um, two semesters and it was um, a language completely different from any that I've studied before, but I now thankfully can actually read it, write it and speak it a little. Um, and then a non-academic highlight was just um, living with my host family. So I was fortunate to live with a um, family who lived 30 minutes north of Copenhagen. And that was the most rewarding experience. They became like my second family and you know we still keep in touch. I've seen them a couple of times since and to me, that was definitely the highlight of this experience. Great. Our final question for our panelists, do you have any study abroad regrets? I'd say my only regret is not having more fun. Again, because I'm first generation, I was very scared that I was going to mess up somehow, that I maybe wasn't going to pass my classes, even though um, the classes are, I was able to choose them. So I, I knew what classes I was going to be taking. I think it was just more the nerds where at like the first months that I was there, um, I was just a very applied to all of my like academics, um, where I had a lot of friends who were able to explore 
more of Mexico. So that's definitely one regret. Um, definitely recommend having fun. If they invite you to go places, definitely say yes. Um, because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, especially because I personally um, do receive or had received financial aid. So um, having most of the program being paid for is obviously a blessing. Um, so definitely have fun. Don't think about it too much. Um, yes. Did you go to a Pumas match while you were on campus at UNAM? You know? can, can you repeat that? Oh, did you go to a Pumas football match? There you go. I did not go to a Pumas game, which okay. I should have, but I did tour the, the stadium. But unfortunately, I did not. Okay. I, did. I have. And I have. And I didn't. And I spent all of three days in Mexico. So it's all about priorities, right? <laughs> uh, Giselle. I actually, I, I kind of echo what, um, what Jacqueline said. Um, definitely uh, wish I had just taken advantage of being there more and gone out more. Um, made more friends. Yeah, that, that is my, my biggest regret personally from that. I do feel like I was just in a bubble at times, just going back and forth from my routine from class back to my host family's home and traveling on the weekends, but I didn't really um, enjoy the city as much as I would have liked. I appreciate that. Thanks for both sharing your insights and um, really the incredible experiences you had in two very different parts of the world, but um, definitely a, a huge um, enriching part of your uh, college experience. Um, do we have any questions for Jacqueline or Giselle before moving on? Just trying to keep an eye on chat and hand raises. I think we are good. Um, now that everyone has made it through the really um, valuable and enriching portion of um, our Adulting 101 session, now I get to take over a little bit um, and share some of my tips and tricks um, from 20 plus years um, of independent travel. And as I mentioned earlier, I did not study abroad. Um, Magdalena alluded to it. A lot of college students, they'll come at, you know, at the end of their UCLA um, experience and say, I really should have studied abroad. I didn't figure out until several, several years later that I really should have studied abroad. So I'm making up for it as I can with independent travel. Um, I just put together a quick little slideshow of me through the years. Uh, if you'll indulge me, that's many, many years ago. Sydney, Australia, um, Anchor Wat, temples in Colombia, I'm Colombia, Cambodia. Uh, it's a doorway in Morocco. Uh, Iguazu Falls in Argentina. Um, I'm not laughing. It's the spray, the mist hitting my face is causing me that expression. Um, high above Hong Kong a couple of years ago. Uh, scuba diving in Hawaii. Uh, this is South Korea where I stopped over for one night uh, to visit a friend from high school who lived there. Um, soccer, as I alluded to, is one of my passions. Here I'm at a match in Guatemala City, rooting on the United States. Uh, Guatemala won that day, which is okay. They were very happy. Um, this is Petra in Jordan, and my friend who's a really good photographer took that shot. I'll never um, probably look that artistic again. Uh, just a couple more, Rio de Janeiro, uh, several years ago riding the children's railway in Budapest. It's actually a train line that every employee is 14 years of age or under, not the actual train conductor, but all the employees are, it's a work experience thing. And that's in uh, New Zealand on a little uh, sled type of thing they have going on. And then finally um, on the beaches in Tobago in the Caribbean, which is a place I always really wanted to go, finally found a cheap ticket and my partner and I went several years ago. So I even dorked out and I put together this map of every flight I've taken in my life to the best of my knowledge. Um, added up to 530 flight segments, almost 800,000 miles and 113 days of my life spent on airplanes, um, which was kind of uh, uh, crazy when I added it all up. It's three and a half times to the moon and back. <laughs> so without further ado, I, it's not about me. It's about everyone else and inspiring um, a love of travel and doing so cost effectively, um, efficiently, trying to travel longer. So I'd love to share some uh, tips and tricks with everybody. 
first, I just want to talk about like traveling with intentionality. And again, if you have your own tips, um, feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to put them in chat. Um, this is not a be all end all list. Um, first, wherever you go in the world, learn the language basics. And I've found that just these five words or phrases go a really, really long way um, to being appreciated by locals. Obviously, hello. Obviously, goodbye. Thank you. Excuse me. I'm always bumping into people or trying to navigate past people. So I say excuse me a lot in whatever language I use. And this is a big one. Where is the toilet? Um, those of you who haven't traveled abroad much, uh, most of the world, they, um, they, they don't go with for a restroom or bathroom or washroom. They just cut straight to the chase and they use the word toilet. So figure out the phrase, where is the toilet, wherever you're going in the world. Two is to research your trip in advance, but don't over plan it. So guidebooks, I love travel guidebooks, guidebooks, travel journals and narratives, movies set in the destination you're visiting, music from there. Those are all great resources to really get acquainted with your destination. Um, and it, this is a shameless plug here in the library in Powell, room 145, we actually have a collection of uh, travel literature. Um, so if you know where you're going, stop by Powell, you can either check out a book or more, and, or just sit and read um, and get acquainted with um, your, your potential study abroad destination. However, some people really have a tendency to just over plan everything down to the minute. I have my itinerary set from sun up to sundown. I really recommend against that. Obviously you wanna do um, some sort of logistical planning. You wanna book your accommodations, especially for your first night in a city. So you're not bleary eyed and jet lagged. Um, you wanna reserve tickets for popular attractions. You don't wanna just, walk up to the Eiffel Tower and expect to be able to climb to the top. Um, you'll want to reserve that in advance. But definitely allow for some serendipity in your travels. Somebody may invite you um, to their home for dinner. Um, somebody may have known of a cool event going on. You don't want to have to turn that down just because you've planned every minute of your trip. And I think some of those uh, spontaneous moments will be among your most uh, treasured. Um, whoa, why am I not moving on? There we go. Um, number three, most major cities in the world have a free city walking tour that they offer. Um, something's going on with my advancing, but um, usually they're led by young adults. They're usually people who are training to be full-time tour guides and they need to have a certain number of hours under their belt um, of giving tours. So um, my advice is sign up for a free walking tour, take it on your first or second day in the city, that will help orient yourself and kind of learn some of the historical context of where you are, some of the modern day realities. And, you know, they're usually about 15, 20 group um, tours. So you'll meet some fellow travelers along the way. And then yes, they are free. Um, it's customary just to provide a tip at the end. Um, $10 usually suffices. It depends where you are in the world, but uh, a tip is always appreciated by the guide. And then number four, I'd say prioritize experiences over sightseeing. Um, so the people you meet along the way and actively engaging in a culture will resonate a lot more than ticking off a list of must-see um, destinations, you know, must-see attractions uh, on your trip. Um, plan around things like festivals, concerts, sporting events, or like a long hike, multi-day hiking trek. And then travel is an incredible opportunity um, to learn something new. You have a block of time or you're not working, you're not in school, sometimes you are in school, but you have this unencumbered time. So try to learn something new, take a cooking class perhaps, uh, get scuba uh, diving certified. That's something I did in Honduras. Uh, it was a, a great week long trip. Um, next, I just wanna go into flights because I think as Magdalena alluded to, that's probably gonna be your single biggest outlay of cash. Um, so forgive this uh, internet clip art uh, GIF that I found. Um, but my first flight tip is avoid backtracking. So um, learn the phrase open jaw. That means when you fly into one city and back from another. So say you want to go to South America, you wanna start your trip in Lima, Peru and end it in Rio de Janeiro. You don't need to book a flight to um, Lima and then back home, you can do what's called an open jaw ticket where you start in Lima and fly home from Rio. And the advantages to that are it, it often, it rarely increases the cost of your international ticket. Sometimes it decreases it. And then you also save the time and money about ha not having to backtrack to your original destination. And then even sometimes things called an open jaw ticket is allowed where you can fly LAX to Lima. And then for some reason you need to be in New York City so you can fly Rio to New York. Flight tip number two 
I call it just get to the continent you're interested in visiting. Um, this could be really uh, um, advantageous if you're studying abroad. Let, let's say you need to get to Budapest for a study abroad program, but your researching tickets and it's $1,000 to get to Budapest. Well, here's a solution. You perhaps you find a ticket LAX to Dublin for $600 round trip. And then you find a budget airline, kind of like Southwest Airlines. There's a ton of budget carriers in Europe um, that can get you from Dublin to Budapest for about $100 round trip. So it's two separate tickets, but you're saving um, $300 in the long run. And there's a bonus to that. You can then stop over and see Ireland for a few days or however long you want along the way. A uh, couple of caveats, you'll definitely want to allow plenty of time if you do um, one of these stopover um, type bookings. And then watch out for additional fees. A lot of the budget airlines, just like we have here, they'll charge for seats, they'll charge for bags, et cetera. Play tip number three, and I got a screen grab there from Google Flights. Um, when you know where you want to go, set up a Google Fair Alert. Um, that will um, set your route, set the dates or approximate dates you want to travel, and then monitor a little bit fluctuations in price. Um, so what I've got on the right here, I'm just monitoring a flight um, to London over Thanksgiving. Um, you can see on the graph, it had dropped as low as 550 bucks round trip. It's currently at $1,100. So it's been that way for what, three weeks now. So say um, I get an alert and it drops down to 600, $650. I'll know that's a really good airfare and that's the time to lock it in. Um, and then another trick is to keep your Google Fare Alert active after you've purchased a ticket. The reason is airlines have become a lot more flexible um, since COVID with refunds and exchanges. Um, so there's a chance you can actually get a partial refund on your ticket or a credit with that airline if it drops even further. Um, you just have to contact them or go online and manage your account. Final flight tip. Book first, decide second. So some of you know um, that airlines in the, U in the US, if you book an airfare, airlines are legally required to refund the ticket within 24 hours of booking. And that's advantageous because if you see a really great airfare, um, stop what you're doing, and it's a place you wanna go, stop what you're doing and book it. Airfares are literally changed by the minute. I've done some research and I've hemmed and hawed, oh, do I wanna commit to a ticket? Do I wanna go there? And it's jumped up by $100 in the next 10 minutes. So airfares can literally change like that. So then book your ticket and use the next 24 hours to request time off from work, uh, find a friend who might wanna join you, and then research the destination, find out if it's a cheap place to go, an expensive place, see if it really interests you. And if you ultimately decide, if you get cold feet, I, don't, I really don't wanna do this trip, you just cancel it online and it, the money's refunded to your credit card. Last set of tips I wanna offer is around accommodations. Um, so first, um, hosteling 101. Um, I think um, in my 20s, I definitely stay in hostels to save cash. Sometimes that word really scares, um, scares people who have never done it before. They think it's like this, you're sleeping with 40 people and it looks like army barracks. And occasionally it still does, but generally hostels nowadays are nice, modern, have tons of amenities. And the amenities you really want to look for in a youth hostel um, someplace with a central location. You don't want to be 25, 30 minute bus ride outside of the city. You want to be somewhere pretty central, especially if you're only somewhere for a few days. You want to look for someplace with a big clean kitchen. One of the best money saving um, um, tools to travel is to go to a grocery store, uh, stock up on items and make a, make a meal or two, make your lunch, make your dinner a few times. Um, and I'll, di I'll digress. Foreign supermarkets are pretty much my favorite attractions or places to visit when I when I get somewhere. I feel it's the best kind of glimpse into the culture. You see what they like to eat, how they package their food, how they advertise things, and you really kind of really get a, a deep dive sense of what it might be like to live there. Um, so I digress, but a big clean kitchen so you can cook for yourself. Um, a communal space, ideally a hostel that has an on-site bar or restaurant, because that will just be like a magnet for your fellow um, travelers to hang out, swap stories, meet people new. I see uh, Jacqueline, you know, nodding a little bit. Um, and then finally, um, a lot of hostels schedule organized activities. I mentioned the free walking tours. Sometimes hostels will schedule walking tours. Um, they'll do cooking classes. They'll go on bike rides around town, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and they're usually at a pretty reasonable cost. And then 
Um, if the thought of sleeping in a 15 person dorm with people you don't know is really scary, the ultimate sweet spot is a private room in a hostel. Um, you get the privacy um, and then with the benefit of meeting fellow travelers. It costs a little more. Um, if you're traveling with a friend, you split the cost. So it's actually not that uh, much more. So I would highly recommend private rooms in youth hostels. Second accommodation tip is booking a vacation home like an Airbnb or VRBO. Um, really that's best for groups and or longer stays. And the reason is they all charge a cleaning fee um, and a service fee. So that tends to make it impractical for a short stay. Um, the, the cost of that cleaning fee, $75, $100, is gonna be the same whether you stay two nights or whether you stay two weeks. Um, and then this is, not everybody knows this, but you can actually negotiate with uh, Airbnb hosts, um, same with VRBO. Um, just message them through the platform, say, hey, I really like your apartment. Um, I'll be in Tokyo for a week. Um, is there any chance you would be willing to discount it X percent or X discount it down to this amount? And unless it's a really busy time of the year where they know they can fill their, fill their, their space, um, they might be willing to work with you and drop the price a bit, and then they'll reset the pricing. Finally, um, I don't know why that just came up, but yeah, usually during the low season is when there's room to negotiate. And finally, overnight trains and buses. So what's better than getting onward to your next destination? I find it's getting there while you sleep and without having to pay for another night of accommodations. Um, if you do do an overnight bus or train, do definitely do your research because they're all privately owned companies and um, the quality of their service, the comfort level can really vary widely. Um, some routes, also the time it takes, some routes stop at every town and what's usually a four hour journey can turn into a seven hour journey. So research how long it takes. Um, and then also paying a little more can be a much more comfortable experience. Um, trains have private cabins, um, some buses even. If you've, if you've traveled abroad, particularly in Latin America, they have these incredible um, double-decker buses with seats that recline almost fully. So um, it's another great way to save on accommodation and it's also a really efficient thing to get, get to your next destination in the morning and you've avoided a night of having to pay for a hostel or a hotel. On that note, we're a couple minutes over. I'm not gonna go through these one by one, but I just put a lot of um, flight resources that I use to find cheap airfare. Um, these will all be linked in the deck um, that everyone can, will receive afterwards and will be linked to on the library website. Um, and then just a mishmash of other um, travel resources, Hostel World for booking hostels, tripit.com, I love. That's an app that basically stores all your itinerary details. And you can even create a link, send it to your parents, say, hey, if you want to follow where I am on my trip, just go to this link and you'll find out where I am day by day. Um, Rome to Rio is great for comparing transportation options. Um, ISIC is great for um, college students because it's an international student ID card. Um, and there's lots of discounts associated with it. A lot of museums will um, give you a student discount. You just show your ISIC card. And then Google offline maps. Um, so most people now travel abroad. They have their phone enabled. They have a data plan. Either they buy a local SIM card or you just go through your company here. But, it, but looking at maps and navigating can really eat up a lot of data. So Google offers something called offline maps where you set an area. You go to say I'm in Mexico City. You set Mexico City in like a 30 mile radius. You download that map and then you're using it offline and it saves a lot of your data. On that note, um, I know I spoke a mile a minute. I was trying to keep our, um, our session to end as close to three as possible. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, definitely have a couple, um, couple minutes for, I can stay after, I don't know about some of our other panelists. If you have any questions, just wanted to say thank you on behalf of our group. And then we have a um, adulting 101 survey, which if I can, I will try to drop in the chat. Um, but does anyone have any questions before we wrap up um, and move on? I know it's a really busy time of the year, so thanks for joining us. Question. Oh. <laughs> no, it looks like we. Um, really covered a lot in an hour. Um, thank you, Magdalena. Thank you, Jack. Let me, let's have you pronounce your name. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no worries, Jacqueline. 
Jacqueline, I'm sorry, I had you do it phonetically via text, but I still got it wrong. I'm sorry, Jacqueline. And Giselle, thank you as well for sharing um, all your insights about study abroad. Um, again, we'll, we'll make this deck um, and the recording available. Um, so look for that in your inbox. And again, thank you, everybody. Thank you. This is a great session. Welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ben.